All right. Shabbat Shalom. We are ready to begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne and we thank you for another blessed week. We thank you for all the blessings that you pour out from heaven. And we thank you, Father, for your protection and your guidance to your people. We thank you, Father, for opening up our minds in these end times that we're living in. And we just pray, Father, that we could draw more of your spirit. We pray for your spirit to guide and lead this study. As we see the words of Daniel coming alive off the pages. And we thank you for your Shabbat that's here and starting. And we give you all praise and honor and glory in the name of your son, Yeshua, we pray. Hallelujah. Okay, we are now up to Daniel 9, one of the most exciting uh, chapters in all the Bible as far as prophecy goes and timeline of when the Messiah will appear in his ministry. And it's very interesting because Daniel 9 is one uh, prophecy that, like I said, through the years... Many of the prophecies, believe it or not, even Isaiah 53, which you read Isaiah 53 and you wonder how can anyone not see that this is talking about Yeshua. I mean, even word for word, some of these things. And although many rabbis and people will have answers for that or so-called answers, even though they're not true. But when it comes to Daniel 9, I've never heard a rabbi or never heard anyone give any kind of conclusive evidence that disproves it because they can't. The only thing that the Jews do is they change their calendar. So instead of giving 240 years to the Persian Empire like it should be, which would bring us to, as we'll see, Yeshua's exact date of his showing from the Daniel 9 prophecy, uh, they only have it 40 years. And you could look in any historical commentary and you can clearly see that the Persian Empire lasted much more than 40 years. So we start in verse 1 now. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahazoreth, of the seed of the Medes, who was made king over the empire of the Chaldeans. So it's the first year of Darius. And uh, we finished last week, chapter 8. We talked about that, the Persians and the Medes that were coming together. And we talked about the Beast of Daniel. Today, it's a little different. It's not really talking about the Beast of Daniel. Because what we see here is, this is... The end of the 70 years, right? So, if we go back to chapter chapter uh, 5, right? Chapter 5, the beginning of chapter 5, this is when the handwriting was on the wall, remember? And at the end of chapter 5, what happens? In that night, chapter 5, verse 30, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was killed, and Darius the Mede took the kingdom, being a son of 62 years. So this is really coming right after that in time sequence. But it's coming toward the end of the 70-year reign. And we know that Yahweh had said there'd be 70 years that Judah would be in the captivity before they can return. So this is, (coughs) excuse me, the backdrop of what's happening here. And verse 2, it says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood in the books of the number of the years which came as the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah the prophet, that he were to accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So, uh, if we go back to Jeremiah 29 and verse 10, Jeremiah 29 and verse 10, this is what he's talking about. He says, for so says Yahweh, when according to my mouth, 70 years have been fulfilled for Babylon, I will visit you and confirm my good word to bring you back to this place. So this is what Yahweh is talking about here. And it's very interesting because Daniel the prophet, right? At the beginning of the book, we're saying it's the beginning of the captivity. He's just a youth, maybe 16, 17 years old. And now this is later. This is like like 70 years later. So he's an older man. He's maybe 86 years old here because we're getting he's realizing we're coming to the end of the 70 years so uh, the other thing that's interesting is this is the first chapter the name Yahweh is used it's not used in the rest uh, you know up to, to now it hasn't been used in the book but in this chapter we'll see many times because he's praying that he's using that name so again kind of takes away the whole thing of the 
uh, rabbinic Judaism of saying the name shouldn't be used even in prayer because we're going to see this is a prayer that Daniel is going to use that, uh, you know, is there. So uh, we find, and also the other thing that's interesting here in chapter, in, in uh, verse 2 is that he's saying the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah. So Daniel is actually confirming that the book of Jeremiah is part of Scripture. And this is only around two decades after Jeremiah died. So it's pretty interesting that even all the way back to that time, it was considered part of Scripture. And he talks about he'd accomplished 70 years, right? 70 years uh, Shavuim uh, Shana, or Shanim, Shavuim Shanim, 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And we've been saying that. It's kind of interesting here that as Daniel is praying that 70 years are coming to an end of Judah's captivity of going back, now we're at a point that 70 years is ended of Israel being a nation again. So we're like in the opposite form here, that where here their punishment was ending after 70 years, and, and you know, it's, we said 70 is an endpoint number. So the punishment was 70 and they're going back. But now we're coming to the end, we're at the end of 70 years where the punishment is coming again. Because for 70 years, Judah has, has, has not been following the ways of Yahweh. And uh, even if we go to uh, Zechariah, the first chapter. In verse 12, it says, The messenger of Yahweh answered and said, O Yahweh of hosts, until when will you not have pity on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you have cursed these 70 years? So, was Yahweh's hand in the making of Israel? Yes. Was Yahweh's hand in the giving back of Jerusalem? Yes. But, at the same rate, because of the sins of the nation and because of the things that are going on there, uh, they did not have Yahweh's blessing. During this time, let's look Jeremiah 5. We'll look at some scriptures here to see this. Jeremiah 5 and verse 1. It says, Roam around in Jerusalem streets and now and see, and know and seek in her places if you can find a man, if there is one who does justice, who seeks truth, and I will pardon her. Wow. So it's almost like if you remember, remember with Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham kept asking, if you find 50 men, if you find 45, if you find 40, if you find 30, if you find 10, right? Here he's saying, roam around and see if you can even find one. And it's not possible. Verse 7 says, why should I pardon you for this? Your sons have forsaken me and have sworn by ones who are not Elohim. When I fed them to the full, then they committed adultery and gathered themselves by troops at a harlot's house. Verse 11. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have been very devious with me, declares Yahweh. They have lied against Yahweh and said, It is not he, and no evil shall come on us, and we shall not see sword or famine. And the prophets shall become wind, and the word is not in them, so it shall be done to them. Therefore, Yahweh Elohim of hosts says this. Because you spoke this word, behold, I will make my words fire in your mouth, and these people would, and it shall consume them. Behold, I will bring a nation from you from afar, O house of Israel, declares Yahweh. It is an enduring nation, it is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor understand what they say. And it's very interesting because Arabic is very close to Hebrew. You know, Aramaic is, is kind of like... Uh, the in-between, you have Hebrew, then you have Aramaic, and then you have Arabic, which they all come from basically the, the same language, you know, or whatnot. And many, although most Arabs in Israel speak Hebrew, they, they do it by school, they have to, they need it for work. Many Israelis speak at least some Arabic. But this is saying a nation's going to come, not a Arabic nation, but a nation with a language you don't know. And who is the nation he's talking about? He's talking about the Persians and the Medes. And it's very interesting that uh, Iranians are not Arabs. Iranians are Persians. You know, they're Muslims, but they're not Arabs. And just now, today, the big thing on the news about America killing the top general in Iran. And now they're saying about retaliation. And of course, Israel's always in the middle because if somebody's going to get attacked, 
it's going to be Israel from Iran. So we see a lot of things heating up here, you know, as we're getting into all this. And like we said the last time, <coughs> excuse me, it is the Medes and the Persians, the Russians and the Iranians who will be along with the Chinese and Turkey, ultimately, who are going to come against Babylon and the Europeans. So, and of course, Israel. So we see this over here uh, as we're coming. Let's go back now to verse 3. And I set my face toward Yahweh, the Elohim, to seek by prayer and holy desires with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So, wow. We see that Daniel is a very, very fervent prayer. If you look at Nehemiah 1.4, we see something similar. Nehemiah 1.4 says, and it happened when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and fasted and prayed before the Elohim of heaven. So he's talking about the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So, uh, you know, I, I put that message online last week on uh, worship, you know, true worship. And like I was saying, it's the seventh gateway to the kingdom. And I was saying part of true worship is prayer. Prayer is worship. And we're really seeing when you look at the examples in Scripture of people like King David and people like Daniel and people like Nehemiah and Nehemiah, we see that these people took prayer seriously and fervently, even even weeping and crying, fasting before praying. And we need to really take prayer uh, seriously because Yahweh hears the prayers of the righteous. So here it is. You know, he's praying about this. And why is he praying? Because they're getting ready to come to the end of the 70 years. And that was the prophecy. And he says, And I prayed to Yahweh my Elohim and made my confession, saying, O Yahweh, the great and awesome El, keeping the covenant in loving kindness to those who love him and to those who keep his commandments. Right? That comes from Deuteronomy 7 9. If we look there, Deuteronomy 7 9. He says, because of this, know that Yahweh, your Elohim, he is Elohim, the faithful, keeping the covenant and mercy with those who love him and to those who keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So, uh, you know, praying isn't just about saying a few words before a meal or before you go to bed. It's about having a relationship with Yahweh because praying is literally talking to him. And it's about uh, him keeping covenant and showing kindness and love to those who keep his commandments. And then in verse 5, and what does he say then? He says, We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done evilly, and we have rebelled even by departing from your commandments and from your judgments. And we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our rulers, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. I'm just reading that to you in Jeremiah 5, right? where he's saying, show me if there's one person that's left. He's showing, should I pardon a nation for this? Of the sins that they've done, they've gone after other Elohim. And now, this is not the beginning of the captivity, but this is the end of the captivity (coughs) that Daniel is saying. He's crying out. Can you imagine? 70 years just about have passed, and he's crying out to Yahweh as if it just happened yesterday. The fervency that's of it. And then in verse 7, he says, O Yahweh, righteous, righteousness belongs to you, but to us the shame of our faces, as it is this day to the men of Judah and to those living in Jerusalem, and to all Israel who are near and who are afar through all the land where you have driven them for their unfaithfulness, which they have done against you. So, again, we see, you know, he's praying for all the people of the diaspora. O Adonai Yahweh, shame of face belongs to us, to our kings, to our rulers, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To Yahweh our Elohim belong mercies and pardons, for we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of Yahweh our Elohim, to walk in his Torah, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel has transgressed your Torah, and turned aside that they might not obey your voice. For this reason, the curse has been poured out on us, And the oath that is written in the Torah of Moses, the servant of the Elohim, because we have sinned against him. And wow, you know, when you you look at this here, it's it's amazing when you think about it, that 
the same prayer that Daniel is sending out here, you know, back 2,500 years ago, could be the same prayer that should be said today. The same exact thing is happening. The same thing that the Israelites and that the Jews did to Yahweh in his covenant back then to cause them to be sent to the diaspora. And now they're back for 70 years. Same number, like it says. And they're doing the exact same things that got them put into the diaspora. So, I mean, this is a prayer that I've given many times at Sukkot. On the last day, we go up to the roof up there in Jerusalem. And literally, you know, we'll get on our knees and we'll pray this prayer word for word to Yahweh. Because it's not only for our brother Judah. It's also for all the tribes of Ephraim that have never come back. At least Judah had 70 years to prove their unfaithfulness for the other tribes of of Israel, the tribes of Ephraim, the northern tribes. uh, We haven't even been giving yet the blessing that Yahweh is bringing them back to the land yet. Uh, But it's also interesting that he says because of their transgression and because they've turned aside and not heard his voice, for that reason, he says the curse has been poured out on us. And that word, we see it in our note there, For curse is Allah. So I think it's very ironic that when we look at this today, because this is a book that's written for our time today, Daniel is a book of the end time. We said that before in chapter 8, it says it four times. This book is for the time of the end. The people can't understand it because it's for the time of the end. And here it is in the time of the end. He's saying because of their transgressions that the curse of Allah is poured out on them. And where does all the trouble come from? We look for peace. But we, what did we get? A time of terror. And what's the word for terror? Hamas. Hamas. So the curse of Allah, the curse of Islam is poured out on them. And who, who are the Arabs? The Arabs are their brothers still, right? The Arabs come from Ishmael, the brother of Jacob, the brother of Isaac, rather. And, uh, and like it says in, in, in uh, Malachi, you know, why do we treat each other so bad when we're brothers? Because it's a curse. This wasn't always like this. The Arabs didn't always attack Judah that way, but they do it now because of this curse, because they've turned away from that. Isaiah 59 in verse 6. And it's sad as we're living this, and we've lived there the last 20 years to actually see what's happening to our brother Judah that we love and we support and we pray for, but to see them bringing on their own destruction is very, very sad. It's a very, very sad time. Isaiah 59, 6 through 8, he says, Their webs shall shall not become clothing, nor shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of evil, and the act of violence is in their hand. And again, that word for violence is Hamas. The acts of Hamas are in their hand. Their feet run to evil, and they hurry to pour out innocent blood, talking about Hamas. Thoughts of iniquity are their thoughts, wasting a ruiner in their ways. They do not know the way of peace, and no justice is in their tracks. They have made crooked paths for themselves. Everyone going in them does not know peace. So, there, say peace, peace, when there is no peace. The, since the Oslo Accords back in the mid-1990s, 25 years now, can you imagine? That there has not been peace, there's only been terror and murder, because they're trying to make peace with terrorists. Uh, and Yahweh says not to make covenants with the people of the land, and they're doing that. So these are some very serious sins. And then verse 12, And he, Yahweh, has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judge us, by bringing on us a great evil, for under the whole heaven it has not been done as it has been done to Jerusalem. And and as it is written in the Torah of Moses, all this evil has come on us, yet we did not make our prayer before Yahweh our Elohim that we might turn from our perversities And understand your truth. So all these evils. He's talking about the evils of Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Let's go to Leviticus 26. What are the evils that will come on Israel? If they turn away from Yahweh's Torah. Leviticus 26, 27 through 35. He says, if you will not listen to me for this and shall walk contrary to me, then I will also walk contrary to you in fury and I will chastise you. I also Seven times for your sins. Talked about that before. It's about condensement of their punishment. And you shall eat the flesh of your sons and eat the flesh of your daughters. This literally happened in 70 AD when the 
city was closed off by the Romans and destroyed and food wasn't left in and they were starving to death. And I shall destroy your high places and cut down your altars and shall put your dead bodies on the carcasses of your idols. And my soul shall loathe you. And I shall make your cities a waste and shall make your sanctuaries desolate. And I shall not smell your sweet fragrances. And I shall make the land desolate and your enemies who are living in it shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the nations and will draw out the sword after you. And your land shall become a waste and your city shall become a desolation. This is exactly what happened to the land of Israel before they came back in modern times. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbaths, talking about the Shemitahs, all the days of the desolation. And you shall be in the land of your enemies. Then the land will enjoy its rest and shall enjoy its Sabbaths. It shall rest all the days of the desolation, that which it did not rest in your Sabbaths while you lived in it. So I find it very interesting that Yahweh actually says that there were actually 70 Shemitahs before they went to captivity. Because he said for every Shemitah they didn't keep, that's how many years they would be in captivity. And we said 70 is a time of end point. So there were 70 Shemitahs they didn't keep. They were 70 years now, like it says in verse 2, to accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And then Yahweh says, Babylon is giving 70 years before Babylon's destroyed. Israel now has been 70 years. You know, this Passover that passed uh, this past year was the 70th Passover. So with the 70 years then. And we're seeing, even for other things, uh, you know, they say the, uh, oh, what was it? I don't know if it was the World Bank was the 70th year. I know it's the 70th year for China. The Republic of China. But this number of 70, it keeps coming up and up and up because it's an endpoint number. And we're literally coming to the 70th year of many of these things. And everything runs on cycles of seven. And that's why this is such an interesting chapter, Daniel 9, because not only does it foretell of exactly when the Messiah is going to come the first time and the second time, but it surrounds itself with these seven cycles of seven and 70s exactly what we have to watch now in the end time because everything is running around sevens and seventies seven and seventies so back to verse 14 it says and Yahweh has watched over the evil and has brought it on us for Yahweh or Elohim is righteous in all his works which he does for we did not obey his voice and now, O Yahweh, or Elohim, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made for yourself a name as it is this day. We have sinned. We have done evilly. And this is a, this is a, a prayer. I think one of the saddest things to me as somebody who has dedicated his life to the work in Israel and has lived there, like I said, with my family for the last 20 years, is that this prayer is not being said by our brother Judah. And it's not being said also by Ephraim. I don't hear too many Ephraimites saying this prayer, pleading to Yahweh, admitting their sins, admitting how much we've fallen, and just praying for Yahweh's mercy on going back there. So this is really a prayer. And who's saying it? One of the most righteous people that ever lived is saying it. He's the one saying it, Daniel. But everybody should be saying it, particularly our brother Judah, but also Ephraimites that want to go back to the land. And now a Yahweh or Elohim who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made for yourself a name as to this day. We have sinned. We have done evilly. O oh, Yahweh, I pray to you according to all your righteousness. Let your anger and your fury be turned back to your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, Mount Zion. For because of our sins and our father's iniquity, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us, right? And what does it say in the end time, right? In Zechariah, Jerusalem is a cup of, cup of trembling to all nations. That's where everything comes from. That's where everything is coming about. And now hear, O our Elohim, the prayer of your servant and his holy desires and cause your face to shine on your sanctuary that is desolate for the sake of Yahweh. And there is no sanctuary of Yahweh that's there today, right? It is, like Yeshua said, there would not be one stone left upon another, and in the city of David, where that sanctuary stood, there aren't any stones on top of each other. He says, O oh, my Elohim, incline your ear and, and hear. 
Open your eyes and see our ruins in the city which is called by your name. And wow, you can go there today. Uh, I've taken hundreds of, 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 of uh, groups there. That you can go there. You can see the city of David. You can see the ruins that are there. And he's saying, open your eyes and see the ruins in the city which is called by your name. For we did not make our prayers fall before you on account of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. So that's, that's Jerusalem today that's there. And he says, O Yahweh, hear. O Yahweh, forgive. O Yahweh, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, O my Elohim. For your name is called on your city and on your people. So this is really interesting because remember, Daniel's in captivity <clears throat> going on 70 years now. Ezra and Nehemiah didn't start going back yet, right? This is the first year of Darius. There hasn't been a decree. So the 70 years are not completely full yet. They're coming to a full. But Daniel, even after 70 years, after 70 years of knowing the prophecy, he is so fervent in faith and so much believing in the word of Yahweh that he is praying as if it already happened. He's praying totally in faith, knowing that Yahweh is going to restore the people. There is not an, a, an ounce of doubt that this is not going to happen because he's believing the same scriptures that we're reading. You know, the same scriptures that talk about 70 being an, a point of end point, right? Where he says, after 70 years, the number of end point, I will bring you back to the land. And Daniel believed it. Daniel believed it so fervently that it, that's the reason he's praying it. And my, my question to you today, to our brethren, is how fervently are you praying for this? You know, I mean, we see all these things, right? We see the uh, September uh, 23rd sign. And, and as I'm thinking about this recently, uh, it's just really amazing me to think about this. Because, like I said, not only is it something that happens once in 7,000 years, to just think of the chances that exactly like it says, there'll be 12 stars in the crown. The moon will be under the feet. The sun will be in the midsection of, of, of the Virgin, right? Revelation 12. And the king's planet Jupiter on November 16th, exactly nine months before, comes into the Virgin. It stays in the womb there for exactly nine months. And right at the time of this sign, Jupiter comes through the birth canal, <laughs> the king's planet, you know, of, of, of being born. And, and, and like I said, all of those things coming together that way happened once in 7,000 years. And if Daniel was alive today, he would have believed it. You know why? Because it was very similar, right, to the star of Bethlehem that happened in the first century. And who believed the star of Bethlehem? The Magi that came. They believed it. And why did they believe it? Because of Daniel. Because Daniel knew the prophecies. Who were the Magi? They were Persian kings. And Daniel told them the prophecies. Because the prophecy that was in uh, the book of Numbers, right? That about the scepter and the star that would come out with Balaam, right? Daniel knew these things. And Daniel was the top uh, pronosticator of the constellations. He was the one. It says that in the book. We've already read it here in the book of Daniel. That Nebuchadnezzar made him that. So he's the top person there. And he knows all these prophecies. And like he said, the book of Jeremiah that he's even saying is part of the word of Yahweh. And he's praying with such fervency, even though it didn't happen yet, because he believed in the word of Yahweh. And you know, there's brethren out there today that actually even say they, that, that they don't even believe this is the end time. <laughs> Do you believe that? There's people that will say they're brethren. I don't know if they're... I, I can't imagine somebody could even have the Holy Spirit and say that. But there's literally people out there that that claim to be have the Holy Spirit and that will even doubt if we're in the end time. People will be running to and fro. Knowledge will be increased. Everything is happening exactly according to the word of Yahweh. And we are living in a time like we've never seen before. We have never, ever, ever, since Adam and Eve, since the Garden of, of, of Eden, we have never seen airplanes and trains and cars and people doing, we're millions, not a couple, millions of people every single day of the week, 365 days of the year, traveling within hours to one part of the world, one part of the world. Knowledge being increased at about every month, it's doubling. The things we're seeing today never had things like this. 
You know, it started out with, with movie theaters and, and film and cameras, you know, the, but now you're talking about things like, you know, the internet being interconnected 24 hours a day, artificial intelligence and all these different things. So Daniel believed it, but how fervent are our prayers for the prophecies that Yahweh shows us? I mean, how much more do we need to see? What, what, what more would we have to see that Yahweh has shown us already that would make us, okay, now I'll believe, right? I mean, the children of Israel, they saw 10 times, 10 times the miracles of Yahweh, including the parting of the Red Sea. And as soon as Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments, they're over there making a golden calf because it's human nature. And unless we surrender that nature... And put on the mind of Messiah. And like I said, take every thought into captivity that this is something that you have to embrace. Not, not just once. It's not something you read. It's something you embrace as a way of life. It's every day of your life. You're allowing the, the Holy Spirit to put the mind of Messiah in you. But, but like I said, man, the fervency of Daniel should shame us. Because this is the way we should be in the times that we're living in today. And then in verse 20. He says, and while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my cry fall before Yahweh my Elohim for the holy mountain of my Elohim, Mount Zion. And while I was setting my prayer in order, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, touched me and my severe exhaustion about the time of the evening sacrifice. And he attended to me and talked with me and said, oh, Daniel, I have now come to give you skill in understanding. Wow. Talk about answered prayer. And I've seen, you know, recently in the last uh, two years in our congregation, we're starting to see miraculous healings, miraculous healings. People that are blind from birth that are are getting healed. Uh, People that had chronic illnesses. You know, uh, this last trip, there was somebody who had chronic illness, back uh, pain, and was anointed and came back the very next day and said, I'm completely healed. We see people that were deaf, People that were mute, that that are being healed, that are hearing, that are seeing. We're seeing miracles that you can't even explain. That you couldn't explain to people in the world. They wouldn't even believe you. That these things that are happening, you know, with some of the miracles. uh, When when, when I was in uh, Ethiopia, you know, the beginning of, of, of last year. And I forget how many people it was now, 25 or 35. Immediate healings. Immediate, right there. We prayed for that day and immediately was healed of all kinds of different things. That happened there. But Daniel believed. And if you want to see your prayers answered, you have to believe. You have to believe. And he believed so fervently and he prayed so fervently that immediately not only was his prayer answered, the the, the cherub Gabriel showed up to him immediately from that. So it's like, wow. And it makes me think of Isaiah 65, 24. Isaiah 65 and verse 24. It says, and it will be before they call, I will answer. While they are speaking, then I will hear, right? (laughs) Because Yahweh doesn't, he knows what we're going to say before we even say it. That's why I say, your prayers don't have to be long and drawn out like the the, the vain repetitions of the pagans. Yahweh knows what we're praying about before we even ask. All we have to do is ask. All we have to do is be humble and fervent and pray to him and seek his face like a child true to his parents. And, and, and that's what he's looking for. That's what he says. He will hear before we'll even answer. And this is how Daniel was. And just to show you how special that Daniel is, go to Ezekiel 14.14. 14. Because Daniel, you know, I don't know. We, we don't talk about Daniel as much. We talk a lot about King David and Abraham, who are awesome, wonderful people, right? A man after my own heart, like Yahweh says, and a friend of Elohim. But Daniel, look at what Daniel, look whose class Daniel is in. In Ezekiel 14, in verse 14, that Yahweh is saying, And though these three men were in its midst, Noah, Daniel, and Job, by their righteousness, they would only deliver their own souls, declared that in Yahweh. So he's saying, he's, he's talking about the judgment that's coming here. And he's saying that even if the three most righteous people that ever lived, Noah, Job, and Daniel, they would only save themselves. They couldn't save them. But and just take this in a minute. Daniel is alive at this point. Daniel is a contemporary. And he's, you know, he's a young man, whatever he is, 30 years old at this point when this is being written, uh, 40 years old maybe. But Daniel is a contemporary and he's put in the same breath 
with Noah and Job. Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Job is at least as old as Abraham or older. And even Abraham isn't put here. Or King David. But he puts the three most righteous people, Noah, right? Noah before the flood. Wow. We look at him, but what do we really know about Noah? That's another world. It's a whole world before the flood. And like I said, Job. He was, he was, he was uh, a mystery figure, right? He was a priest, a Melchizedek priest. Righteous man, self-righteous at times, but learned his lesson. But Noah and Job and then Daniel. So we're dealing with somebody really, really special here when you're dealing with Daniel. Faithful his whole life. And you know something? Daniel never got to go back to Israel. Though. Although he prayed this prayer, uh, it wasn't Yahweh's will. It was his will for him to sleep and wait for the resurrection. He will certainly be there when Yeshua returns. But he didn't go back with Ezra and Nehemiah. He was an old man. Maybe he died. You know, but but we know he, he wasn't one of the ones that went back. But he was interceding, almost like Moses, right? What did Moses say when he found out he wasn't going to the promised land? He asked Yahweh, put somebody there. Let me lay hands on Joshua so that they'll have somebody. Don't let them go in as sheep without a shepherd. And that's the same way Daniel was. He wasn't only praying for himself. He's praying for his people and he's praying for the nation with such a fervent prayer. Which is amazing. Uh, and then verse 21, very interesting, right? Because not only is his prayer answered, wow, it's answered in a way that, you know, would be amazing. Answering that the cherub Gabriel shows up there, right? And he's there. And who is Gabriel? He's the warrior of El. And his job is to bring important messages from Yahweh. If we go to Luke 1 and verse 13... Luke 1 and verse 13. He says, But to the cherub of Yahweh, but the cherub of Yahweh said to him, Do not fear, Zechariah, because your prayer was heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son to you, and you shall call his name Yoganon. And he will be joy and exultation to you, and many will rejoice over his birth. And he shall be great in the eyes of Yahweh and shall not drink wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many to the sons of Israel to Yahweh their Elohim. And he will go out before him in the spirit and power of Eliyahu to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and disobedient ones to the knowledge of the just to make ready a people having been prepared for Yahweh. And Zechariah said to the cherub, but how shall I know this? For I am old and my wife is advanced in her days. And answering the cherub said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands before Yahweh. I was sent to speak to you and to announce to you the good news of these things. So he's the warrior of El, and his job is to bring special messages from Elohim. But wow, what a way to get your prayer answered, right? <laughs> Amazing. Uh, then we continue our verse 24. Now we start getting into the 70 weeks prophecy. Uh, like I said, the most amazing prophecy in Scripture. As far as the timing, as far as the timing of the Messiah's coming one time and his return. So it says 70 weeks, 70 weeks. And it's very interesting here because uh, Shavim is the Shavim is the word for 70. And it says 70 weeks. And the word for weeks is Shavuot. Shavuot. So it's literally 70 Shavuot are decreed as to your people and as to your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy to anoint the most holy. So there's six things that have to happen here. And granted, I'm not saying that uh, this, of course, this prophecy, especially in verse 25 and 26, and particularly verse 26, talks about Yeshua coming to the earth the first time and his death, you know, for the uh, sins of the people. But if you look at verse 24 over here in the 70 weeks, uh, there's no way that you could say these six things were fulfilled. Because look, here are the six things that are decreed. And what are they decreed to? They're decreed to the holy city, to Jerusalem. So it's not decreed to the nation, but it's decreed to Jerusalem. So there's 70 weeks decreed 
as to your people, so it's to the Jews, and to the holy city Jerusalem, to what? Finish the transgression. Finish the transgression. Is the transgression finished in Jerusalem? No way. <laughs> wow. It's, it gets worse by the day. Open homosexuality. and I mean, all kinds of stuff there. So that didn't happen. To make an end of sins. Of course not. There's many, many sins going on in Jerusalem and with the Jewish people. To make atonement for iniquity. Okay. That's the one we can say, yes, Yeshua did do. He did make atonement for iniquity. To bring an everlasting righteousness that has not happened to Jerusalem yet or the Jewish people. To seal up the vision and the prophecy. It hasn't happened yet. And to anoint the most holy. No, that'll happen when Yeshua returns. So he hasn't been anointed yet as king of Jerusalem and king of the world. That'll happen on his return. So primarily this is for the end time. Most of these things, if not all of them, uh, except for the uh, atonement, it, they, it hasn't happened yet. So clearly this is for his second coming. And then it tells us, now it's going to say, it says, Know this and understand... That from the issuing of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince shall be 70 weeks and 62 weeks. So there's going to be, I guess, uh, seven weeks is 49 years. Seven times seven is 49 years. And then 62 weeks of seven there. Altogether, 482 years. It shall be built again with a plaza and a trench, even in times of affliction. So, there's no way to misunderstand this scripture. So, no and understand from the issuing of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the Messiah, the Prince, will be... And this is why, like I said, why the Jews don't have an answer for this one. Because we know when this decree went out. This decree went out... In 457 BC, by Artaxerxes I, that's when the decree went out to go and restore Jerusalem and rebuild the walls and all the other things that happened from there. And if you add 483 years from there, remember there's no zero year, so it goes from 1 BC to 1 AD, you come out exactly to 27 AD when Yeshua started his ministry. I mean, exactly, there's no way! And, 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 and my question to any of our brother Judah who doesn't believe it, well, if Yeshua is not the Messiah, then who was the Messiah in 27 AD? Because when the Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD, 70 again, an end point number, they destroyed all the records. The temple had all the records and all the genealogies. And today, somebody might be able to say they were Jew, and they might even be able to prove that with DNA. There's no doubt about that. But DNA doesn't prove that your lineage goes to David. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of different lines that come from Judah. But the Messiah has to be a son of David. And you have to be able to prove it. And that's why in Matthew uh, 1, it talks about the lineage of who? Of, of, of Joseph. Proving that Joseph is not the father of Yeshua. Although he is from the lineage of Judah. And then you have Luke 3 showing the lineage of the mother Miriam. That comes from uh, through the father Heli, because since Miriam was uh, the only daughter, what happens, it goes through her father, the lineage of Heli. So it's very interesting here that there's no doubt about this, that uh, this will happen. Now, what we said, though, Daniel is a book for the end time. We already went over this over and over and over. So if... This 70 weeks prophecy was about Yeshua's first coming, then it would also be about his second coming. And what we, I find very interesting is uh, years ago I was watching BBC and it was all about Jerusalem and the old walls of Jerusalem. And the commentator said, well, of course, these are not the original walls of Jerusalem. These walls were commanded under, under the under the decree of Solomon the first to go back and restore and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And I'm like, whoa, he's literally reading Daniel word for word. And I'm like, come on, come on. What year was it? What year was it? And it was the year 1538. And you can look in any encyclopedia to see that. So, wow, 1538. So if you go to 1538 and you wait in 490 years, you come exactly to 2028. Here we are in 2020. But remember, you know, we don't know now because the Messiah came the first time after 69 weeks. So we don't know if the same pattern is going to come. But I can tell you this much. 
There's a lot of stuff that's coming down as we're heading into the Shemitah. And the same way that Daniel was fervently praying about this, I know I'm fervently praying about it, and I believe it, because I know that Yahweh's word says it, and I know in the last hundred years all the things that have happened in Shemitahs. And for anybody who just is taking this with a grain of salt and not preparing, you know, even though we had Pharaoh's dream that Joseph interpreted, and we know that it's also for the end time, then I, all I can say is they just have no faith. Because we need to be not like the Laodiceans, because the Laodiceans think they're rich and increased with goods in need of nothing, and they're poor, they're blind, they're miserable, and naked. The Laodicean is never going to take this stuff serious. But for Yahweh's people, we better take it serious, because this stuff is real, and it's happening, and every single thing is fitting into place exactly like Yahweh said. And, you know... Uh, only Yahweh knows the time because he says when 70 years are decreed by the mouth of Yahweh so we don't know exactly when that started when did Yahweh's clock start was it that first year Israel was a nation was it the second year was it a certain date of that I don't know maybe somebody will come up with something but we know it's right around that time and we know that we're right we're, we're right there near the doors and we know from this prophecy here now that uh, next year will be, uh, you know, after 2021, will we'll be the, the, the 70th seven of this prophecy year. And we know in 2022 is the Shemitah year. So all these things are convergence to the perfect storm all at once. And if the prophecy was fulfilled the first time in 27 AD, what makes us think it's not going to be fulfilled this time? So without a shadow of a doubt, wow, this is all coming together in an amazing amazing way and then verse 26 and after 62 weeks Messiah will be cut off that literally means he'll be killed he'll be like a sacrifice but not for himself we know that he was a sacrifice for the people if we go to Isaiah 53 Isaiah 53 In verse 4, surely he has borne our sicknesses and he carried our pain, yet we esteemed him plagued, smitten by Elohim and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his wounds we ourselves are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have each one turned to his own way, and Yahweh made meet in him the iniquity of all of us. Wow. And then if we uh, drop down to... Verse 11, he shall see the light, life of light, the fruit of the travail of his soul. He shall be fully satisfied by his knowledge on my righteous servant, justified for many, and he shall bear their iniquities. Because of this, I will divide him with the great and with the strong. He will divide the spoil because he poured out his soul to death and he was counted with those transgressing and he bore the sin of many and he made intercession for transgressions. Just like we're seeing here. Daniel 9, verse 26, and after 62 sevens, 483 years, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of a coming ruler shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people of a coming ruler. Who was it? We know it was the Romans. The people of a coming ruler. It was a Roman prince that did this. And its end will be with the flood and ruins are determined and war shall be until the end. And we know war is coming in Israel. We know it. We know from Zechariah 13, two-thirds of the people there will be cut off. We know from Revelation 11, when the two witnesses end their, their witness and they're killed, that there'll be a great earthquake and 7,000 people will die in one-tenth of the city. There'll only be 70,000 people there left at that time. And now there's more than a million. So we know that this is coming. So the end shall be with the flood and with runes of determined and war will be until the end. Uh... And it's interesting because the people of a coming ruler will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And like we said, the Roman Empire, everybody thinks of Rome and, and the Pope and the resurrected Roman Empire, but I don't see it. I, that, that's something that came out of the Protestant Reformation. I'm not saying that Catholicism is not uh, you know, part of, of this, this great you know, uh, end time uh, religion of, of whoredom like the Bible says, but I just don't see 
especially now. I mean, Rome is in such problems. Their military isn't strong. Their economy isn't strong, nothing. But what's interesting, what people miss is the Roman Empire had a Western capital and an Eastern capital. The Western capital was Rome. The Eastern capital of the Roman Empire was Constantinople. So literally, Turkey is also the head of the Roman Empire. <coughs> and look into... Uh, President Erdogan background that he claims to be a prince from the Ottoman Empire and even from the Mahdi. He claims that from the last uh, uh, religious leader that they had there, their caliphate, that he is, is a relative from the caliphate. So that's what I believe more than Rome. I believe that Turkey will be the player there that will fulfill the scripture and then when we look in verse 27, it says, And he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. That's the last seven, right? The 70th seven. And in the middle of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and the offering to cease. And on the most outer corners, abominations by a desolator, even until the end. And that which was decreed shall be poured out on the desolator. So he'll confirm a covenant with many for one week. When we were in Daniel 8 last week, what did we read in verse 25? And also through his policy, talking about the anti-Messiah, he will make deceit succeed in his hand and he will lift himself up in his heart. And by peace, he shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, talking about Yeshua, but he shall be shattered without a hand, right? Talked about that in Daniel 2.44. In the end time, Yeshua comes and shatters this beast and all the kingdoms that are part of that beast. So like we see here, he's going to make this covenant. And what's interesting about it when he says he'll confirm the covenant, it's to reestablish an already existing covenant. So we already know what the covenant is. The covenant is already Oslo, roadmap, uh, President Bush, uh, Bush, President uh, Trump is calling it the deal of the century, <laughs> but it's all the same thing. It's dividing the land of Israel, making a Palestinian state. And then Joel 3, Yahweh says, when they do that, his wrath is coming on the earth. And wow, we're getting close. We're getting close to these things. And as we're seeing these things happening now with Iran and with Turkey and Russia, I mean, it's like we're hitting a, a, a tipping point. And I really think that in this end time chess game, 220 is going to be, you're going to see a lot of pieces moving in a lot of directions heading up for it because like I said we're getting closer and closer toward the Shemitah which can really be a breaking point you know uh, as we hit the 70 year point so we see he will confirm a covenant with many he will make a reaffirm an existing agreement already with the many so it's not just going to be with Israel Palestinians but will be with many could be a world pact or it might be with the whole Arab world for one seven and in the middle of the seven, he will cause the sacrifice and the offering to stop. So it seems to be that they will start offerings again. And this is where the abomination and desolation is. Look what it says. And on the most outer corners, abominations by a desolator. Matthew 24 in verse 19. Matthew 24 in verse 19. Verse 15, I'm sorry. It says, And when you see the sign of uncleanness and desolation that was spoken of by Daniel the prophet, which will stand in the holy place, he that reads, let him understand. So the type of this originally was Antiochus Epiphanes. What did he do? He sacrificed a pig on the altar there at Yahweh's temple, and he put up a, uh, a big image of Zeus that was there. We know that Nebuchadnezzar and his image, he put up the big a uh, 60-foot image that was to be worshipped. Whoever didn't worship it was thrown into the fire, right? So something like this, some kind of abomination is going to happen. And it's going to be, we, but from the book of, of Mark, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to be. So I don't believe it's going to be in the city of David where the temple really was. I believe it's going to be at the false place at Fort Antonia, the temple now. Because Yahweh would only allow Satan he will allow him to mirror something. He will allow him to counterfeit something and forge something. But Yahweh will never allow Satan to desecrate something that's holy to Yahweh. 
It just doesn't work that way. And then Daniel 11.31. We see the same thing. Daniel 11 and verse 31. It says, And forces will stand away from him, and they will profane the sanctuary, the fortress. (laughs) Interesting. They even call it the fortress there. And they shall remove the continual sacrifice, and they will place the abomination that desolates. So again, we said the daily sacrifice today is Yahweh's grace on the earth. So that will be removed by something that's going to be done. Because the people are going to accept this. Whatever this false worship is, and this, this, this being that's going to be Satan himself, Satan will possess this person, uh, he's going to be worshipped by them. We know it. It says it. That all the earth, maybe we'll go there for a second. Revelation 13. Revelation 13. And... Verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with it? And a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy to given to it to act for 42 months. So we know that's the only, that's the time it will be given. And then it makes war with the saints. In verse 7. And all authority was given to it over every tribe and kindred and tongue and nation. And all those dwelling on the earth will worship him. Those of whom the names have not been written in the book of life, and the Lamb having been slain from the foundation of the world. So that's what happens. He makes this covenant. He breaks the covenant, though, right? And causes the abomination of desolation. And then what happens, though? And on the most outer corners, abominations by a desolator, even until the end, and that which was decreed shall be poured out on the desolator. So when is that going to happen? This is in Revelation 16. Revelation 16. This is the wrath of Yahweh being poured out. So it's saying that which was decreed by the anti-Messiah will be poured out on him, on the desolator. Revelation 16. And I heard a great voice out of the sanctuary saying to the seven cherubs, Go and pour out the bowls of the anger of Yahweh onto the earth. And the first went away and poured out his bowl onto the earth. And it came to be a wicked and painful sore unto men, the ones having the mark of the beast and the ones worshiping his image. And the second cherub poured out his bowl onto the sea and it became blood as of a dead one. And every soul of life died in the sea. And the third cherub poured out his bowl onto the rivers and onto the springs of the water and it became blood. And I heard the cherub of the water saying, you are righteous, O holy one who is and who was and who will be because you judge these things. Since they poured out the blood of the saints and of the prophets, and you gave blood to them to drink, for they were deserving. And I heard another out of the altar saying, Yes, Yahweh Elohim Almighty, your judgments are true and righteous. And the fourth cherub poured out his bowl unto the sun, and it was given to him to burn men with fire. And men were burned with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of Yahweh, the one having authority over these plagues. And they did not repent to give him glory. And the fifth cherub poured out his bowl onto the throne of the beast, and its kingdom became darkened. And they gnawed their tongues from pain. And they blasphemed the Elohim of heaven from their pains and from their sores, and they did not repent of their works. And the sixth cherub poured out his bowl onto the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And this is already happening now, that they can come for the big battle in Israel. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they were spirits of demons doing signs which go forth to the kings of the earth, even the whole inhabitable world, to assemble them to the war of the great day, the day of El Shaddai. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is the one watching and keeping his garments, that he does not walk naked, and they may see his shame. And he assembled to them in the place having called in the Hebrew Armageddon, right? And then the seventh cherub poured his bowl, and a great voice came from the heaven saying, It has happened, and there's lightnings, and, and this is where we have our. So, like I said, this anti Messiah, he's going to stop the sacrifices, he's going to cause the abomination of desolation until the end, and then that which was decreed will be poured out on the desolator. So we know he's thrown into the lake of fire, the beast and the false prophet. And when Yeshua returns, that's coming. And here we are. <coughs> We're really at this spot now. And to me, the book of Daniel was always exciting to read and to go through. But wow, I can't imagine a more 
exciting time ever in my life to be going over a Bible study of Daniel and Revelation, these things now, as we're seeing all these things happening. And like it says, when you see these things begin to happen, look up for your salvation is near. So the Bible says we need to encourage each other with these words because for us, although it's sad to think of the suffering and the horror that this world is going to go through because of their rebellion toward Yahweh, especially in Israel, but we know in the end that Yahweh is merciful and for those who will repent and those who will change, that Yahweh will forgive them and that his kingdom is coming to bring all righteousness forth on the earth. So praise Yahweh for a wonderful chapter here in the book of Daniel, the ninth chapter. And next time we will be going over Daniel, the 10th chapter. Yahweh bless. Shabbat Shalom.